Um, so questions before we... Yeah, yesterday was review, today we're continuing review. So questions before we just kind of continue through the list of topics? So the ODPs really helped with, uh, I probably missed this yesterday. That's okay. Uh, the ODPs really helped with uh, prepping for the midterm. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend using to prep for this? Uh, Same thing. The ODPs? Yeah, so um, <coughs> PA4 is good to look at. Um, PA5 probably doesn't help you a whole lot with programming in general, right? Because you probably use stuff you already knew, uh, making a bash script. So really, the ODPs, the earlier programming assignments, are still good for practicing algorithms, basic C syntax, um, getting command line arguments, parsing things with scanf, stuff like that. Um, we haven't really built a whole lot of algorithms on top of that. So even though that was that was usable for the midterm, it's still good for the final. Well, uh, so where did we leave off? GCC? We talked about GCC yesterday, right? Yeah. So the dash C option gives you a .o file. Okay. So, um, so GDB. Um, hopefully you've been using GDB. If not, um, you'll want to practice with it because it's about the only way you'll get through 222 in winter is, is by being able to use GDB because we're really going to need to like know what's going on inside, and printf statements really won't work um, in the stuff we're going to be doing. So, what should you know of GDB for this final exam? So, GCC G says compile and include information that can be used for debugging. So, it'll give you variable names, it'll give you your source code, uh, names of functions, things like that. Um, and then all your usual stuff. So usually when I do GCC, I like to specify the output file so everything's not called a.out. So dash o, whatever you want to call your executable program, and then you list all your source files in the usual way. Um, and this gives you an executable. Okay, if you want to run that, you just say program. If you want to run it in GDB, you say GDB, and then the program name. And that brings you into GDB, and it gives you some kind of prompt. It's funny, I don't actually know what that prompt is. It's probably GDB. Parentheses, okay. Um, but yeah, so it gives you a prompt and basically says, Okay, boss, what do you want to do? And you give it instructions, okay? Um, and typically the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say start. And that initializes the whole system and it creates a temporary breakpoint so that when it's ready to start running your code, it comes back and it prompts you for more instructions. And most of what we do is either we say list to look at our source code we say p or print some variable name or expression to look at the value of something. We can say x to examine some memory location, which we haven't really used in this class, but that's what we'll be using all the time in winter. Um, so x looks at a memory location. Um, if we just say continue, it'll go ahead and it'll run our program and it'll run until it's finished. So typically we put in breakpoints and we can say break and we can put in a line number, we can put in the name of a function. I think you can do things like function plus some offset, right? But somehow we say when you're running, if you get to this location, stop running. Come back to me for instructions. And after we've set a breakpoint, if we say continue, it'll run until it hits a breakpoint or things exit otherwise. Um, 
I don't think we talked about, and so it's not going to be on the exam, but we can also set watch points. The watch points are really useful. They say basically if this variable changes value, treat that like a break. Stop executing, come back to me. And this is really useful because a lot of times when you're debugging your code, you're waiting for something to happen and something else happens. Right, you're supposed to be looping through your code, but for some reason this variable gets turned into a zero and your loop exits. And you don't know why that is, right? So you put a watch point on that variable and as soon as it changes value, the debug debugger stops. And it says, okay, I'm at this line of code and this variable just changed. And it was a two and now it's a zero, right? And you can see exactly what caused it to change because it stopped right at that line. So that's a really useful one, but we haven't talked about it much. That's so not on the, on the test. Um, but it's like a breakpoint, changes when, breaks when a variable changes value. So we can say continue and it runs until you hit a breakpoint or we can say do one thing, either a step or a next. So next is basically a step over, which says if we're about to call a function, execute that whole function and then come back and ask for instructions step is a step into which says even if we're about to call a function just do the beginning of that call and then come back it says do one thing right one in one C instruction and then come back this says do one sort of logical thing if we're calling a function go through the whole function and come back so if you're about to do a printf say next if you're about to call a function that you want to debug you say step and now it's inside that function and you can start single stepping so that's a step over, step into from MP Lab, And that's pretty much it, right? That's, that's, I think, all we've talked about with PDB. And that's, you know, 98, 99% of what you need to do in GDB to debug a program pretty, pretty successfully. Um, you can look at variables. You can step around. You can set breakpoints. That's kind of all you need. This, by the way, don't underestimate its importance in life. Um, not on the exam, but in general. Right, you can print expressions, you can print the return of functions, so you can you know, print f open and call f open like that. Um, so that's, that's a powerful mechanism. Um, so I think that's, that's plenty for GDB. Um, so make files. So how many people here have been using make files in their assignments? Okay, that's, I didn't use make files for like the first 20 years that I was in Linux. <laughs> so, don't feel bad. Um, so make file, it's usually called make file. It's a text file. It can be a lowercase m, but usually it's uppercase. And it's a file of pairs of lines, so we have basically what we call a target, a colon, and then a list of dependencies. Files that need to be up to date in order to build this target. And then the next line always starts with a tab, and there's a recipe. And we just have a succession of these pairs. So you're at your Linux prompt and you say make. It looks for a file called make file in your current directory. If it finds it, it looks at the first line, thing before the colon, that's what it's going to try to make. So this is typically the main target. And it will look at the list of dependencies and it will say, are those dependencies all up to date? If they are, it will execute the recipe and it exits. If those dependencies are not up to date, it will look for a way to create that dependency, to recreate that dependency, and it will see if its dependencies are satisfied, and if so, it executes the target. So here's, here's your quintessential make file. So let's say we want to build main program, and it depends on main.o, and S1.0 and S2.0. 
and if those are all available and up to date then you have a GCC line which says how to build main program And then main.o depends on maybe main.c. And you build main.o from main.c by saying gcc-c. And s1.o maybe depends on s1.c and include file s1.h. And you compile s1.c to make s1.o. This is totally arbitrary or imaginary. So there's a, there's a typical make file, all right? And if you say make, it will say, okay, I'm trying to make main program. I need up-to-date versions of main.o, s1.o, s2.o. So main.o depends on main. It'll make sure main.o exists. If it doesn't, it'll try to build it. If it exists, it'll say that depends on main.c. It'll make sure main.o was made after main.c. If it was, it says, okay, that dependency is satisfied. S1.0, it exists. It depends on S1.C, S1.H. Well, suppose S1.H is newer than S1.0. It says, oh, I better rebuild S1.0. It'll go ahead and do this thing. Now you've got an S1.0. It's newer than both of these. That dependency is satisfied. If S2.0 exists and is current, then it'll go ahead and execute this command, and you've got main program. Mm hmm uh, percents the prompt from from bash in this case. You just say make and it does all that. Okay. Right. That's why we use make files because otherwise you'd have to figure out which of these commands to type in. You'd have to type them in yourself, right? So once your make file set up, anytime you want to build your program, just say make enter. And if you didn't have to do it, it'll say everything's up to date and it won't do any work. It won't spend any time. Okay, that's more than sufficient for what you'll need next week. Tar files. So tar is a tape archive. It's typically for taking a bunch of files and putting them into a single thing. And tar by itself writes to a tape. Well, we don't have tape drives on our laptops. So we usually write into a file. So if we want to create an archive, we say C. V is optional, but it says be verbose. Tell me what you're doing. F says instead of writing to an actual tape drive, let's write into a file. So CVF is followed by bless you, by the name of a file that you want to use as the archive itself, right, in place of the physical magnetic tape. So this is not a C program you're trying to save, right, this is a thing that you're using as an archive. So CVF, archive.tar, and then a list of files. And that can be wild carded if you like, you can say star.c or whatever. So three versions of tar that we've used in here, CVF, TVF, and XVF. So CVF creates an archive. TVF shows me the table of contents for that archive. So it's just a way to list what's in an archive. And XVF extracts from that archive. And extracting doesn't get rid of the things in the archive. It just pulls out copies, leaves them in your current directory. And this is one of the few Unix commands that doesn't take dashes in the front. But you probably won't lose points if you put a dash in there. Okay, so that's, that's really all we've had to do with tar. And to submit things, all you've really had to do is CVF. But XVF if you want to pull things out. And then gzip and gunzip, there's not a whole lot. To do 
right? Gzip file gives you a file.gz, gunzip file changes it from a gz to an uncompressed file. Right, so I can do tar cbf my archive dot tar star and it should put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things into my archive dot tar. And with the V flag it listed all of those for me. And if I do a TVF it shows me what's in my archive. And if I do XVF it takes those files from the archive and dumps them in my current directory. So now I've got a copy of my directory in this new area. All right, and they're still sitting inside. The V is just asking it to give me extra information. If I don't do a V, it gives me a short listing. So, but more is better. And then if you want to do zip, um, so there's file.z, gzip, file.c, and now I've got a file.c.gz. Which is 165 bytes. If I unzip it, um, F unzip, that's weird. If I G unzip it, I get back my file.c. Hey, zipping it saved 12 bytes. It's pretty impressive. Regular expressions. So, kind of like tar, we really used a pretty small subset of everything we can do with regular expressions. So a regular expression is like a wild carded pattern, right? So you can have some kind of character and in general if you ask for a Q it's looking for the letter Q. If you have a 7 it's looking for the digit 7, right? So a character in a regular expression is just matching that character but then there's a few exceptions. There's a period which is a wild card that'll match any character. There's bracket 0 through 9, bracket A, E, I, O, U, right? Things in brackets, they match any of those. So any of those five letters or any digit from 0 through 9 or any uppercase letter and so on. And there's... Uh, blah followed by an asterisk, right? Which looks for zero or more occurrences of whatever blah is. So if I say A asterisk, it looks for zero or more occurrences of the letter A. If I say bracket zero dash nine, close bracket asterisk, it looks for zero or more occurrences of a digit. If I say dot asterisk, it looks for zero or more occurrences of anything. Okay, so asterisk modifies the thing that comes right before it. And it says look for zero or more of those. And then the only other thing is your anchors. So a caret says starting at the beginning of the line, a dollar sign says ending at the end of the line. So if we search for caret x, it's got to be an x at the beginning of the line. If we just search for x, it's an x anywhere in the line. So I think that's everything we've used for matching patterns, right, for finding something that, that matches. And then for substitution, like in VI or said, where we say substitute old with new and possibly with a G at the end. So what's the G do? Yeah, which means 
Yeah, so substitute as many times as you can on the line. Without the G, it says substitute once if you can. So this does it everywhere. This does it once. So when we're doing substitutions, the old is a regular expression that we're looking for. And whatever matches that gets replaced with new. Well, in those regular expressions, we can put things inside parentheses, which we escape with a backslash. And then the contents of whatever match the stuff in between the parentheses goes into what we call a register. And we can get to it with a backslash one. And if we have multiple things grouped in parentheses, they go into successive registers. So here's a said statement. I'm saying take the first two characters starting at the beginning of the line, followed by any three characters, right? But I'm matching those first two, putting them in R1, matching the next three into R2, and replacing them with the second register followed by the first. So I'm going to take the first two characters and move it after the next three characters on every line. So if I do A, B, C, D, E, that becomes C, D, E, A, B. So that is an example. If I do A, B, C, D, nothing happens because it did not match the pattern on the left. The pattern on the left was looking for at least five dots, five of any character. Didn't find it, so it didn't do a substitution. So regular expressions are, you know, the topic of entire books, but this is pretty much everything we've had to do with them, right? Ways to match patterns and then substitutions and putting things in registers and possibly using those inside the new piece. And if it's not terribly warm and fuzzy, just spend some time playing with it, right? It, it, starts to make sense much more quickly when you're actually typing these things in and seeing what they do. Um, it's, it's almost nonsense to just listen to what I've said, <laughs> right? You really got to kind of get your hands dirty and, and experiment with it. <coughs> Say again? Yeah, they should be posted up there. Yeah, those, those are decent practice. Um, and you can also just like you know, do crazy stuff. So what if I replace a dot with nothing and I say do it everywhere on the line? Right, it gets rid of everything. <laughs> what if you want to replace the actual periods? Um, I think you just escape them with a backslash. do terrible things, but that was pretty fun. <laughs> Alright, so I matched the period and I replaced it with two instances of it. I said do that everywhere. Alright, so, um, so regular expressions. Okay, so said and awk. Um, Well, awk is, awk is straightforward. Most of what we're going to do with awk is something like awk, and our program might just be print something, right? And what we can print are things like dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, to pick up the first field, the second field, the third field, and so on. 
So if you want to print the, the third word from each line using awk, Right, I can just print out third field equals dollar sign three, and I can say this is a test, and it says third field equals A. And that's that's probably as much awk as you need to know. You can put line numbers in here. Um, but generally we'll just do it on the whole file and it's a way to sort of break things up based on columns. Um, this is not on the test but but I forgot to mention it before if you say dash F followed by some character it uses that character as a separator instead of a space. So if you want to read a comma separated file you say dash F comma and it'll use commas instead of spaces but I won't ask you that on the test. But we always deal with CSVs. Or you can pipe your CSV through sed and change the commas to spaces and then use awk. Um, all right, so sed deals with lines. And this is probably our most normal way, most common way of using sed is just to do regular expression substitutions across a file. So it reads a line, it applies a substitution, it writes the resulting line. Right. And I think that's probably as far as I go with said, but we learned some other stuff. Um, we can search for a pattern. Which can be a regular expression. And we can also put instructions on here like P to print and D to delete. And so we can say, if you match this pattern, print that line. If you match this pattern, delete the line. And there are also things like insert and append and so on. So um, I'm not going to ask you the weird stuff. Um, know how to print, know how to delete, know how to do regular expression substitutions. And here again, we can you know, put things in parentheses and use the values of registers over here. And we can also put a G at the end to say do this globally. So, and that's the examples we were doing up here. That's probably sufficient Linux, other than, you know, whatever you do regularly that I didn't remember to put down here. Um, but if you've been working in Linux for 11 weeks, you probably know most of what you need to do. Um, there's 20 or 30 short answer questions about Linux, 50 points, so a couple of points each. Um, I don't have tricks on here for the most part, right? Most of the questions are going to be pretty straightforward, so if it says Show me a Linux command to remove a file named blah, right? RM space blah. <coughs> write it down and move on, right? I'm not tricking you like, oh, you have to make sure the file exists first, so write a shell script and say if not dash e, blah, 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 right? I'm not trying to give you busy work, okay? Especially if I give you like that much space to write an answer. Um, and you can always ask, right? Do we have to make sure the file exists before we remove it or something like that? But, um, but I'm really just kind of looking for, you know, I mean, I mean, I believe everybody here will do really well on this exam, right? Certainly on the Linux questions. I don't expect it to, to shock you or surprise you or baffle you, right? If you go blank, I can't remember how you set a breakpoint in GDB and I didn't put it down in my notes, you know, take a shot and don't worry about it. Um, it's a point or two. Um, so the other 50 points are programming. Um, the bash programming, I didn't add anything here from the midterm study guide. Okay, We haven't really learned anything more about bash programming since the midterm. Um, you used Xenity, but you didn't learn any new bash to do that. right? You used 
back quotes to capture the value um, of this entity command that it sends the standard out. You, you know, use set or grep or something to to um, process the reservations file. But you didn't have to learn like new bash programming concepts. Um, and maybe you did, which is cool, but, but this is basically sufficient. Um, is there any questions about the bash programming stuff, loops, conditionals? I'm not going to ask you about arrays. Um, all right, and then C programming is almost exactly the same as from the midterm study guide. Um, I don't know if this might be new or not, but um, do you know the difference between angle brackets and quotes when you say number sign include? So normally we do this. Quotes are for like Yeah. Exactly. So if I say include quote myfile.h, it's looking in my current directory for something called myfile.h. Okay. If I were to say this, include quote slash user slash include slash sddio.h, it will look for a file called slash user slash include slash sddio.h and include it, right? And that would work fine, but this is a pain to write over and over and over again. So the angle brackets are just a shortcut. Okay, angle brackets mean look in slash user slash include slash whatever you put in the angle brackets, in this case, stdio.h. So it's just a convenience. Because most of these include files weren't written by us, they're available for us, and we want to use them every time we write a C program, so they're sitting in some system directory. And the angle brackets just point to that directory. So it's just sort of a shorthand. Um, so this may be new. So these things from C type, so is space, is digit, is alpha, two upper, two lower, and so on. Um, those are good to know just because they save you time when you're writing code, right? So um, is space some character tells you, is it a blank, a tab, a vertical feed, a new line, a form feed, something else, right? Any of these things. And this returns something that you can use in an if statement. It returns basically a true or false. And it saves you from writing five or six if statements or an if statement with a bunch of ors together, right? Same thing with is digit or is alpha. Yeah, and those are all on ctype.h. And they, they, they just save you from having to do ASCII arithmetic and having to write all this stuff out and having to reinvent the wheel, right? So I don't think I ask you um, specific questions about these, but they're useful to know, right? If you're trying to convert something to lower case, you can just use two lower, bless you, or two upper. You're doing it and not, you put the exclamation point in front of it. Yeah. So exclamation park always point always negates a condition. Um, one thing to be aware of, two lower does not change the argument. It's a function. It's not really a function. It's a function, and so we can't we can't change the argument. We could actually say something like this though. C equals two lower. C so it returns the lowercase or uppercase version of the argument. So assign it. Um, so you've used those at least in PA4. Um, Make sure you know how to use scanf. Make sure you know how to use argc and argv. Okay. Again, if, if they're not warm and fuzzy, write some code and just experiment. And it will make a lot more sense than looking at your notes or looking at Google or watching YouTube videos. All right. Just go ahead and write some code. And, and for some reason, the active part of doing that usually causes it to sink in and be more meaningful. Um, 
So the first argument is an integer. That's the number of arguments, including the program name. Program, this is fun, argc equals four. Okay, three arguments plus the program name. Argv is an array of strings. Argv bracket zero is program. Argv bracket one is this. Argv bracket three is fun. Argv bracket four is seg fault time, right? So before you use argv bracket anything, you gotta check argc. Make sure that you've got enough arguments to use whatever argv you're looking at. Um, Scanf takes a string, converts it into other things. Typically integers in this course. Um, well, so someone asked about this last time, so let me just... So we've got code. Um, so I'll prompt for two numbers. I'll do an F gets to read a line of text into str, and then we'll do an scanf. Scan with 2% d's into i and j, and then we'll print out ij and the return value from scanf. Right, so this is just test code. So if I put in 1, 2, 3, space 4, 5, 6, that's the value of i and j, and scanf returns 2. If I put in 1, 2, 3, I is 123, J is just gibberish, right? But the return from scanf was 1. That's how I know J isn't meaningful. The 1 says you converted something into I, you did not convert anything into J. So I got 1 integer. Right, 1, 2, 3, ha, 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 same thing. It converted one thing, that was I. If I put in ha 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 four five six, it returns a zero. It did not convert anything. Even though the second thing is an integer, it did not convert it. Right? So I and J are both gibberish. Alright, one, two, three, four, five, six, ha ha ha. It converted two things, I and J. There's extra stuff, it doesn't care. Right. I didn't say to do anything about extra stuff. I said convert two integers. It did, so it returned a value of 2. If I hit enter, return value is minus 1. That's a special value. That's EOF, end of file. It's saying that it was trying to convert some stuff and it ran out of input. Okay. So how do I know if I and J are both meaningful? Check the return value, see if it's 2. Okay. If something went wrong, the return value could be 1, could be 0, could be minus 1. Right? If, something, if everything worked right, the return value will be 2. So make sure you're, you're comfortable with that. And then the file I.O. I think is the only other thing that's actually new um, since the midterm. So a few functions. So file is a type that's defined inside um, standard I.O. And when we want to deal with files, we make a pointer to it. So I usually use FP for file pointer. And it's a pointer to type file. And so we can say FP equals F open. And we've got a file name. And we can say, quote, R, if we want to open the file for reading. We can say, quote, W, if we want to write the f open the file for writing. And there's other options. OK, so let's say we have a string, 120 characters. We can use F gets. and say read 120 characters from standard in, store what we read into this array str. If we want to read from the file instead, we can just change that third argument and use our file pointer. 
read 120 characters from that file up to a new line, store the results in this array str. So if we open this for reading, we got back an fp, we can use that right here inside fget. We can also use an fget c. Instead of fget c standard in, we can say fget c fp, and it'll read one character. And on the output side, we can use something like fprintf, fp, comma, and then whatever you would put in a printf. So your conversion string as a string, and then the variables you want to actually convert. And if you were to do this, if you were to fprintf to standard out, comma, blah, 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 it looks exactly like printf. Right? And printf really just calls this, calls if printf, fprintf with an argument of standard out. So that opens a file, these things read from the file, this writes to the file. And then when you're done, you can close the file with fclose. And that frees up the resources and also makes sure that anything that you've written to the file that's buffered up gets flushed out so that it actually goes into the file. And if you want to force your buffered output to go into the file without closing it, you can use fflush. Quotation W. That's a scribble. So read for reading and W for writing. So um, manual pages. So F open comes from standard I.O., returns a pointer to a file, takes two arguments, a path name and a mode. Path name is just the name of the file. Mode can be any of these things. R for reading, R plus for reading and writing. W to truncate the file and start writing. W plus for reading and writing. A for appending. And so on. The mode string can also include the letter B. The letter B has no effect and is ignored. And you can do other things with this, right? Um, you can move back to the beginning of a file, you can rewind and seek, and, and this can play with low-level stuff. But for what we're doing and what we're going to do next quarter, right, this is, this is sufficient. So open, gets, print, close, flush. So test code, file fp, fp is f open, haha, comma, w, so we're opening a file for writing. I'm going to check the file pointer and make sure it's not null, right, because zero is an invalid memory location, zero is also an invalid file pointer, right, it's a pointer, so if we've got a zero that's pointing to memory, that's invalid, so that's how it flag that something went wrong in the f open. Otherwise, I'll do fprintf and I'll write a message into my file, haha. -ha. Right, so I just made a file. And if I try to open slash haha, -ha, and I run that, it'll say, oops. Right, I got an error when I tried to do my f open. Why? Because slash is a directory that I don't have access to. That's the system level top, direct, top level directory. So I basically got a permission error when I tried to open that. If I don't give up at that point, what happens? Say fault. Right? Why? Because my file pointer is null, when I call fprintf, it's going to look at the thing that fp is pointing to, which is a zero. It tries to read from memory location zero. That's your seg fault. Right? So you want to check for erroneous conditions and you want to respond accordingly.
right? And this, this I saw fairly often on some of the code on the midterm, where you would do a great job of checking to make sure that your argument w was available and was valid. But if it wasn't, you might print a message, but then you just continue on through the code, and then you bump into a seg fault, right? So if we don't have a valid file pointer, I'm just going to exit here. Those are just details. Um, let's see, da, 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 da. everything else was already on the midterm study guide, so, which doesn't mean it's unimportant, it just means it's not new. Um, so five programming questions, um, which are probably about the same level of difficulty as they were on the midterm, possibly a little more involved, but not like twice as hard, right? Um, so you did five programming questions in 50 minutes on the midterm, and you might have gotten time crunched towards the end, right? But in, say, an hour and a quarter, you probably could have done all of those. So probably hour and a quarter, hour and 20 minutes or something should be plenty on the final for the programming questions, including being able to sort of work leisurely, and then that leaves you like a half hour for the short answer questions. And I don't think you can spend more than a minute on each question because there's just not that much to think about for most of them, right? Some of them you'll have to do some analysis, but, um, you know, write a command to, to change the name of this file to that. You can't remember the name of the command. You don't need more time, right? <laughs> so it's, it's on your notes or it's not and you make a guess. Um, but, so I think it's going to be plenty of time. Um, you don't get extra points for finishing early though. So um, my suggestion, right, go through, you can start with whichever one you want, but, but um, if you start with the programming questions, leave yourself some time for the short answer. Um, but make a quick pass through, see what you're getting into. Um, do the stuff that you're pretty sure you know how to do. Write down the programs you can write down. Um, if you're stuck on something, leave it and come back, right? Um, budget your time, but, but don't spend an hour on the first programming question because you can't remember how to do argc, argv, right? Because um, 10 points each program, okay? It's all equal weighted. Um, budget your time, um, try not to panic, and I think you'll have plenty of time, and then if you finish early, right, you can go back and Double check, run your logic, play computer on the algorithms, make sure they do the right thing, because there's a fair amount of silly mistakes that come in, too, where you know, you're trying to find the maximum of two numbers, but you wrote the code to find the minimum of two numbers. It's not a deal breaker, you're gonna lose a point maybe, right? But if it's, if it's something that fundamentally changes the difficulty of the assignment, right, you might lose a lot of points. So, um, so if you got time, you can use it to go back and, and uh, double check and rethink your work. And then when the exam's over, you can like forget all this stuff for a few weeks. No, don't forget it. All right, so any other questions? All right, I went 20 seconds over, my bad. All right, I will see you in 2.15 and or next week.